Greetings, Dragon Ball fans, and welcome to another part in this series, What If Vegeta Killed Gohan? In the last part, we saw Majin Buu achieve his final, ancient, Kai-free state, Kid Buu. He now faces a determined and no longer Majin Gohan. Gohan can easily feel Buu's energy continuing to grow, and sensing no further presence except for that impossibly malicious core, he takes aim with a Kamehameha. His hair slips smoothly to that golden green as the energy ball in his hands grows brighter and the ground around him starts to jitter ever so slightly. The pink boy looks down at Gohan and smiles viciously. He casually takes aim and immediately fires a beam. Now at last able to really let loose, Gohan smiles too and fires his Kamehameha. The beams meeting each other is suitably spectacular, but it starts pressing down ever so slowly towards Gohan. As he sees it slowly making its way down to him, a pulse of red ripples through his golden aura, and the beam surges back up towards Boo. Not one to let that go unchallenged, Boo pours more and more energy into his attack, stopping the approaching Kamehameha mere inches from his hands. Again it pushes back down towards Gohan, slowly at first, but gaining speed as the true Majin dumps more power into it. A pulse of electricity arcs across the ground around Gohan as he effortlessly pushes through to that newly acquired legendary Super Saiyan 2 state. He's had enough of these Kais and Majins and Wizards. It's time to end this properly. What did that pointy-eared old git say? He could already access it all? Hmm. With no qualms about releasing its full power, Gohan says quietly to himself, Kaioken. Everything around him is promptly flattened as an impossibly deep red energy mixes and dances through the golden green and masses of electricity, continuing to arc out, tearing up the shattered ground surrounding him. The beam widens and twists, drilling up towards Boo, much faster than the Majin can react. Now picking himself up out of the dirt and debris, Akumu looks around, past the calmly smiling Gohan. His gaze settles on a still unconscious, fat, and mostly good Boo. Akumu walks over slowly and picks up the remaining half. He gazes into the unconscious blob for a moment, then reaches down into the suddenly very much awake Boo's throat. He digs around for a bit, then pulls his arm out, with not one, but two rapidly expanding sacks. Everyone looks on as the once good Boo staggers back, gasping and starting to break apart, small blobs and swirls floating away on the wind. Akumu leans in and asks him if he's going to come back, try to be someone a little nicer. Shin collapses to his knees, seeing not only the gigantic South Supreme Kai, but also the ancient Dai Kaioshin. When things have settled down, and seeing that Gohan is getting along surprisingly well after Babidi and Shin worked their respective magics on him, Akumu decides that it might be a good idea to travel to that alternate past timeline. With the old settings on the time machine, those cyborgs are about to appear then and they might want a heads up about Boo and Babidi as well. At the very least, that whole absorption thing, that could easily turn things sideways, fast. Safe in the knowledge that it won't break anything, Gohan chooses not to accompany him this time. He's already had his goodbye with his mum, and that was really the only thing he wanted from them, a chance to actually say goodbye. A few days later, the time ship reappears above Capsule Corp. After it settles, Akumu steps out. He heads inside to fill everyone in on their past selves' goings-on. Upon arriving in the past, Akumu had headed to the lookout to meet Piccolo and a similarly young Namekian, who turns out to in fact be Kami. After meeting his two young and very powerful descendants, Akumu and Akujin, Kami had decided to wish for his own youth, bringing back much vigor and power in his own right. With so many threats looming on the horizon, they could surely use the extra help. They are both pleased to meet Akumu again, but saddened to learn that Akujin is no longer his own person. Kami, for one, was quite taken with his grandson. Otherwise, though, everything's going pretty much fine. Much to Goku's disappointment, there are no androids or cyborg or whatever kind of threats to worry about anymore. Speaking of Goku, though, it's probably a good thing that none of the future Son family decided to accompany the big Namekian. Goku has been verging on insufferable these last few years. After future Gohan and co. had departed back to their own time, the present-day Gohan had been constantly yammering on to anyone who would give him the time about how utterly cool and amazing future Gohan and Bulma's kids, his totally awesome grandchildren, were. 
Because of this, the younger Gohan and Bulma had been, for a long time, stuck in this truly awkward, if not slightly forced, friendship. He was also adamant that they should all just train really, really, really hard in preparation for these android cyborg -y things. He was, of course, also chomping at the bit to figure out some of what he had seen in future Gohan. The limiting factor there was having to rely on his Gohan to decipher things. On the slightly less annoying side of things, however, Goku takes his heart medicine in time, though only because pretty much the entire group of them had kept harassing him about it. Grape flavor be damned. In the meantime, with his experience with Kaioken and both Goku and Piccolo's aid, Gohan has managed to unlock the base Super Saiyan form a few years early. He is currently knocking on Grade 2's door while wholeheartedly pursuing this vastly modified Kaioken after his future self had handed him that tantalizing, if not almost completely illegible, treasure trove of a notebook. Despite his father's insistence on pure training for preparation and the constant cringe-inducing references to those fantastic future grandkids, Bulma and Goku were eventually able to sort out their friendship. Gohan, of course, has a keen mind as well as his skills in combat. While perhaps not at Bulma's level of scientific knowledge, he's certainly no slouch. Having both met with, and spoken at some length to, those future versions of themselves, they were both greatly affected by the events that shaped their alternate future lives, as relayed to them by those future selves. They had decided instead to work in secret, at least from Goku, to locate these androids and try to deal with things ahead of time. It's just not worth the risk, even with the Dragon Balls. All it takes is one wrong move from Piccolo or Kami, and poof. Not knowing anything about Dr. Jiro's involvement, Bulma and Gohan got a rush course in detective work. Usually following the money, they would pick possible targets, and Gohan would sneak off to investigate with the likes of Piccolo, Krillin, Tien, and even, to his great surprise and delight, on a rare occasion or two, his mother, Chi-Chi. Well before the original android attack should have taken place, they arrived to find the rotund, fully android 19, and a very frail and still entirely human Dr. Jiro. They are in the process of preparing Dr. Jiro's attempt to transfer himself into what will be his new body. While 19 does manage to drain Piccolo a bit, it promptly gets its arms ripped off, when the Namekian finally takes notice of his own considerable power dropping slightly. The android's head is then embedded in a wall, sans torso. Seeing Bulma staring at the ailing Dr. Jiro, Gohan tells her to look away. He then walks over and raises his hand to put an end to Jiro and his machinations. Despite everything, however, he just can't bring himself to kill this defenseless, clearly terrified old man. Bulma steps in to distract the boy while Piccolo moves up and blasts Jiro's feeble body through the chest. After a moment, they start to investigate 16, 17, 18, and 20's pods and their programming. While they were warned about 17 and 18, and the visibly twitching cybernetic Vegeta, they were a bit confused by the still dormant 16 and the recently terminated 19's existence. And weirdly, this Vegeta doesn't seem to be in any way cybernetic. Nothing like that monstrosity that the future Bulma had showed them video of. There are no visible implants, save for a mass of thin needles leading to his twitching muscles and a single massive cable connecting to a helmet that wraps entirely around his head. After poking through more of the files, Bulma discovers that this is not actually Vegeta at all. Some sort of clone. And what on earth? Jiro was actually planning on uploading his mind into it? He was going to use Vegeta's body? The differences here are hopefully similar to those of the future Trunks timeline. The visit from the entire slightly extended Son family, all those years ago, has set things on a slightly different path. Gohan fiddles around with deactivating the android's bombs, while Bulma carefully comments out those few offending lines of code, removing their directives to kill Son Goku. There is no code for, uh, 20? Um, new Vegeta, maybe? Only some sort of audio-visual and stimulation simulation. She pulls up the file, and they watch in rapt attention as the training sequences play out on the screen triggering matching twitches and jerks from the all but mindless clone. It's training this new body's muscle memory with every skill and technique ever displayed by Goku, Tien, Krillin, and more. Unsure how to proceed, they decide instead to secure things here and leave them all in their pods until Bulma can be sure that the deprogramming was correct. Once home, she decides to add additional material to Vegeta's training feed. 
fondly remembering some of the TV shows that she had loved during her more formative years, about family and other such things, she adds them to the feed. Things that are utterly lacking from Giraud's purely combat-oriented simulation, not to mention utterly absent from a more traditional Saiyan upbringing. Man, I hope the original Vegeta never has to meet whoever this guy turns out to be. While Gohan was hesitant to leave them there unchecked, Piccolo's opinions rang true. They have been effectively disarmed, deprogrammed, and for now, remain innocent in all this. And according to those files, they weren't exactly here by choice, were they? And even this Vegeta isn't that Vegeta at all. Hearing his concerns, though, Bulma agreed to set up cameras and alarms and whatnot to alert them in case of any unexpected changes. Akumu certainly can't bring himself to agree with this, but ultimately he decides that he must respect their choice. It won't affect his timeline at all, so Master Gohan won't mind too much. Sadly, he opts to return home again and leave them to their chosen fate. Before he leaves, though, Akumu pays a visit to the old Capsule Corp building to briefly meet the younger Bulma, then to Mount Pauzu to meet the younger, more innocent Master Gohan. Once back in his native timeline, he tells them of what has transpired in the past, alternate timeline. Gohan is more sad than angry that they didn't all hunt down the androids right away, but he seems happier knowing that their Bulma and his younger self have taken some of the initiative and seem to be more in charge of things. From here, a time of general peace and quiet passes. The continent's rebuilding efforts are in full swing, and Capsule Corp is raking in the revenue with this overall booming recovery economy. Every day, the cities and villages most affected by the androids' rampage look just a little bit more like home. Despite Gohan's initial protests, Akumu has resolved to follow in his father's footsteps. He finally takes his place as Earth's guardian. While often found atop the newly rebuilt lookout, positioned above Korin's new tower, which is itself just outside of West City, he is determined to take a much more active role in earthly events. He is just as likely to be seen milling around Capsule Corp and in the training halls and classrooms of the neighboring Son School. Once settled into this new lookout, the Namekian also sets about rebuilding what little family he had tried to have before, proudly producing not one, but two eggs in quick succession. I suppose it's worth wondering if he installs a new time chamber to round out the traditional lookout's aesthetic, assuming he even knew how to, since he does not innately possess any of Kami's knowledge. I get the distinct impression that that would be very low on his to-do list, if it's on there at all. Why would anyone want to subject themselves to that insanity is beyond him. You're probably wondering if a certain G.O.D. will be showing up after the Boo arc, searching for his possible rival, the Super Saiyan God. Dragon Ball Super's Black Arc implies that at the time of the Boo saga, and presumably shortly thereafter, Black had not yet appeared there and slain the Kais. Thus, it's reasonable to assume that Beerus is still snoring it up on his inverted pyramid of a homeworld. I suppose we could rationalize that original alternate timeline's lack of a Beerus being due to the fact that there are only three Saiyans remaining that we know about in that universe. Why the Oracle Fish couldn't see the possible use of their time machine is another question entirely. Maybe he was just afraid to mention it. In this timeline, however, there are enough beings in possession of Saiyan blood. There's the half Saiyan, Gohan, and at least three one-quarter Saiyans, Goku, Jinbei, along with the new baby Panch. If you include the distant and as yet unknown Broly and Paragus, that's six. Paragus poses a problem, though. While Broly would certainly qualify for the ritual, since despite being a full-blooded Saiyan, he's portrayed as just a slightly less educated, but firmly post-noggin-bumped good boy Goku. While Paragus is surely pure-hearted by any Saiyan measure, he is not pure-hearted by our, and presumably Shenron's, more traditional sensibilities. Thinking about it, would Gohan even qualify at this point? Can a pure heart harbor such resentment towards the local deities? Or could his Kaioken's rather impressive burning red but carefully contained aura be mistaken for something more than it actually is? This oracle fish can certainly see that any trip Beerus might take to Earth would be met with no small amount of resistance. There'll be a fight, maybe even enough of one to impress the lazy, self-important dessert stealer. So, here we have another opportunity for those few viewers who've made it this far to choose. Does Beerus have his prophetic dream? Will he descend on this Earth to face a man who himself dreams of a more atheistic universe? All is not lost, though, if Beerus chooses to snub our heroes. 
Back in that alternate past, they also have enough Saiyans to hand, again with the ambiguity of Paragus's worthiness. Hopefully one or the other oracle fish is slightly less limited in scope than that of the future Trunks' timeline. Ultimately, we will find out next time on Dragon Ball. What if Vegeta killed Gohan? <laughs>